Hello, everyone. I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast. If this is your first time tuning into the food enthusiast on Jaymore Living, I am a writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. Today's guest is a Renaissance woman, and the list of her accomplishments is extremely long. But let me start with she's a Fulbright scholar. She's a restaurateur, she's a photographer, she's a humanitarian, she's an environmentalist. Let's welcome Arena Stein of Alma Kachina. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dara. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and there's so much to talk about um, that I, I don't know where to start. So let's let's go with what's current that you were a restaurateur and your first restaurant was Cafe Azafran. Am I pronouncing it right? Azafran, Where was that? Yes. So Cafe Azafran was at the Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University. And we started it in 2004 and we closed it uh, last February, 2019. It was a long time. And it was a wonderful experience feeding these great astrophysicists, astronomers, astronauts, you name it, and the rest mm -hmm. of the community at Hopkins. It was a real privilege and pleasure. Well, you actually met your husband there too, didn't you? So yes. it benefited you in many ways. Um, yes. And then you did another cafe at Johns Hopkins. What was that called? It was called Alchemia, which uh, you know, is basically uh, alchemy, um, but with the roots in Arabic language because it was in the humanities building at Hopkins. It was located right in the middle of it. And um, it was a very multidisciplinary building, uh, you know, with language, cinema, sociology, history, archeology. span And so it was the perfect name for a building that had all these people working in projects together, very multidisciplinary. But very early on, you were into sustainability Mm -hmm. in the restaurant and making sure that there wasn't waste, that things that you worked towards your goal of as an environmentalist, um, your degree, your master's degree in cultural anthropology. Um, it's all wrapped up. You went to Stanford on the Fulbright scholarship. So Alchemia, and then you opened Alma Kachina in 2015 here in Baltimore to rave reviews you brought up um chef enrique um from caracas which is your hometown venezuela and venezuela mm -hmm. cuisine um just amazing uh you were down in canton can you tell people more about what the cuisine was about and, and alma cachina because it still exists but you've moved recently mm -hmm. so alma cocina latina started um actually um, <laughs> as a project of a simple arepa bar that was the original intent um, and we were we actually found this wonderful location through bill striever who was the original order uh, owner of the can company and right. um, so we started there and it was much bigger project than i thought uh, and so it was a very mystic way that i found enrique limardo who was a you know huge award you know chef, a uh, multiple award chef in Venezuela who had traveled the world using ingredients from all over the world. And we connected through this extraordinary chef, Carlos Garcia from Venezuela, who introduced us. Enrique was already here in the United States, uh, just six weeks in. <laughs> and uh, he his project that he came for wasn't working very well. And I needed a chef, a Venezuelan chef that understood uh, Venezuelan food with tremendous depth and as well was very creative. And so Enrique, I couldn't have dreamt for a better chef um, than Enrique to start this proposition. So he moved to Baltimore along with a colleague of his and Enrique stayed on with us to create this fabulous restaurant. So um, there are not many Venezuelan restaurants in the world. I, I would say that recently uh, they have grown a little bit around the world because the tremendous mm -hmm. exodus that has happened of 5 million people that have left Venezuela for all the reasons that you're probably familiar with. And so we got very fortunate to get a chef 
uh, from there. Because generally, Venezuelans don't like to leave too much unless you know they go traveling or they have deep professions somewhere, deep roots somewhere else. But otherwise, they have a hard time leaving the country because very family oriented and it's a beautiful country. But right now, it's a it's a place hard to live in. So that's how we started, and it's a very interesting culinary region in the world that has been. Uh, unfamiliar to a lot of people. So that was the idea to bring Alma here, have people explore those those roots of the Caribbean region of Venezuela. Well, I know Enrique, there's nothing, I cannot begin to say how beautiful, now the food was delicious, but the plates were breathtaking. Yeah. Um, if you could get the Washington Post, which gives four stars, gave you three and a half. You know, and just amazing. And the picture that he um, posted was the ravioli, mm -hmm. um, but the Venezuela ravioli stuff with. Um, uh, it's fish, yeah. basically. Yeah. Oops. Oh, boy. Sorry. Okay, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Something always happens. Don't worry about it. Um, and now. You've moved. Most people know that you were down at the can company down by the harbor. Um, and uh, you are now moved to Station North. Mm -hmm. And you have the location. Actually, it was the old Charles. Um, it was the, the Chesapeake. Old, the old Chesapeake restaurant. And you're in there. And you're doing two things now. Mm -hmm. And... Of course, there is uh, Alma Cucina Latina, which is in the afternoons at 5 p.m. And then there's also Alchemia, or Alchemia, which is a partnership with Mira Kitchen. And this is a baby that you started back in March. Why don't you tell people what you're doing with Mira Kitchen? Okay. Okay, well, first I'll finish with the Alma Cocina, uh, a little story. So Enrique Limardo, our original executive chef, moved on to Washington, D.C. He stayed as our culinary director, but now he has a restaurant called Seven Reasons in D.C. and about to open another one called Imperfecto. Uh, but one of the, the people that came from Venezuela to, to work under Enrique Limardo's style of cuisine and schooling, let's say Venezuelan schooling, his name is David Samudio. And he's from Margarita, where actually they do the chucho, which is what's inside that famous ravioli picture. Uh, and he's a very talented young man, 27 years old, who who is taking on the lead as an executive chef of, uh, of Alma right now, and also has been taking the responsibility as a, as a chef for the Alchemia Initiative that we partner with uh, Mera Kitchen Collective. So I wanted to briefly say that uh, alchemia, uh, which is written like this. <laughs> I want yeah, everybody right. to see. Ah, there. <laughs> and we think that as we're talking, links to everything that we're talking oh. about will appear in the, um, with the show. It'll also appear on jmarliving.com page when that goes up a little bit later today. And uh, all the links will be there for people uh, to check out. And before I forget, socially, you don't want to miss the photographs because uh, uh, Arena is a fabulous photographer and she's done books of food and people and things of that nature. So her Instagram is, um, you can find the Instagram basically for Alma Kachina. Uh, it is, I'm just looking at my notes here, uh, almacachinalatina.com. Um, so the Instagram is almacachinalatina. Uh, and that's the Instagram for that. And what you saw, the sign, Akima, <laughs> is um, also, that's up there, Alchemia Baltimore. So that's on Instagram and Facebook as well. So... I stepped so, on your turn. Continue. To no, talk. no, no. It's good. Thank you for the intro. Uh, so, Alchemia is a is a baby that was born uh, at the third day of the pandemic, closed down uh, or locked down in Baltimore. So <laughs> it was a very quick birth, and uh, it was the product of a partnership 
marriage, solidarity, um, you know, co-decision with um, uh, the, the team of Mira Kitchen Collective. Mira Kitchen Collective is a, is a company that is also um, housed under the same roof as Alma and Alchemia. Mm-hmm. And we share the different hours at different times of the day. It's a wonderful new way to do business, I think. Sharing a space, sharing the times, u- utilizing all the resources together. It, it produces tremendous solidarity. It produces tremendous growth on all of us and an exchange of ideas, development, but also it's a safeguard to our businesses because we share then, we're able to share the rent and utilities and things that normally are very difficult for catering companies such as theirs or Alma, a restaurants such as ours. So to be under the same roof is a novelty and it's something that we didn't expect at the beginning at all, but resulted in, in this union thanks to the work that we do with Alchemia. So Alchemia, like I said, it's a, it's a baby, it's a pandemic baby. Um, uh, Mera Kitchen Collective and, and, uh, and us at Alma have always been very sensitive to uh, the, the realities of immigrants. Our kitchen, of course, is all immigrants. I am, an, you know, recent immigrants, we're all immigrants, but recent immigrants. And Mera also focuses also um, on, on immigration from other, other parts of the world. So the humanistic component has always been there. The awareness on how to support our teams and our employees has always been there. Uh, and uh, so it, it, we came together because number one, we wanted to make sure that our employees all would keep their work going. Alma was closed. They lost their catering, um, their catering, uh, how do you say, contracts. We lost our catering contracts as well. So um, we focused on starting to prepare basically uh, meals for the community, as was requested by some communities to Emily, who is one of the co-founders of uh, of Mira and who's very connected to to the community to Baltimore at large. So immediately, you know, all the Alma kitchen team went over and we started this this joint effort and it grew, you know, like like Emily always says, every week, you know, we thought, okay, we have enough money for another week and we have another money for, you know, because it was basically done on donations and grants from, from people. And, and suddenly, of course, we got the sponsorship uh, uh, from World Central Kitchen, the initiative of Jose Andres, that always is, it seems to be very timely with the difficult times in you know, the different countries and the different communities. And that was a huge uh, uh, resource for us, not only because we were able to provide so many more meals to, to the city of Baltimore and different neighborhoods, but also it taught us um, um, a business model. It was very different from what it normally exists as a business model for providing meals to uh, those neighbors of of ours in need that don't have access to dignified food. And so normally, as you know, (laughs) I always say that the budgets that are available for feeding people in the schools or feeding kids or, or feeding communities in general, the, the budgets are impossible to make something good with them. The budgets are $3, $4, $5. The, 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 um, the concept of Jose Andres of budgeting $10 per meal, although it can sound a lot to, to some people, but if we think about all the things that we, you and I, are people like us who have the privilege to eat well every day and a balanced meal every day, we know how much food costs and we know the cost of sustainability we are aware of all the things that surround food so we know that uh you know a very small budget such as three to five dollars to include food to include labor to include delivery is simply not going to have a good result so it continues promoting those those reduced budgets are first of all, uh, I think, an expression of not giving the importance to the food and to nutrition to the to you know the community, the population at large, and you know giving the and getting more of the same, so more obesity, more diabetes, more you know uh, more addiction to foods that are not necessarily really good for you, and so what we're trying to do is to cut all that and start 
fresh and start really thinking that we all deserve good food and in the most sustainable way we're trying to uh, to provide it to our communities you know and to yeah to have to basically have all of us together a dignified meal every day so that's I, the base of this i just um Dole just did something they did malnutrition labels that they put up on the shot tower. I don't know if you've heard about that. No, no. And another building. And, you know, this was all about um, 88% of adults don't meet the daily fruit intake, but most alarming and what supports what you're doing, that one in four Baltimore City residents are food insecure. Yeah. And the, it'll come up on our links, but it's Mara Kitchen Collective. Donations are greatly accepted. And whereas, you know, it is, is the money there to do these sandwiches. And luckily, you know, people have been coming in and donating different sponsors, Jose Andreas supporting at different times, but the money is needed and uh, to get these meals out. And these are not just, you know, a piece of white bread. This is a healthy, full course meal. Mm -hmm. On mm -hmm. top of that, what you had told me is that your staff is being paid a good hourly wage mm -hmm. on top of this. So this is mm -hmm. working, keeping people secure in their jobs and mm -hmm. with some coverage, health coverage, which they normally wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. The donations supply these meals, and we were just talking before going on air. We have reached a, a landmark number that you have produced, your group has produced 100,000 meals since March. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, you should be proud. Um, I'm going to come back because I jump around, Irena. I'm what are the typical foods coming out of Venezuela? We know that there are arepas, but what is what is the other standard cuisine or cuisine will we have? Should we be in Caracas where you're from? Uh, that's a big question because it's all new. But uh, the arepa, let, let's just say that the arepa is the symbol of our food it, because it's the daily bread and like every culture, you know, every culture always is known by their bread, by their pocket. Their, every culture has something that they fill in with, you know, their spices and their proteins and their vegetables, etc. So ours is the arepa. It happens to be gluten-free. It happens to be delicious and very neutral flavor. So you can put any kind of food in there or any kind of leftover, which is great. Mm -hmm. So the, the arepa is very important symbolically for us for that reason, but also because all this exodus that has occurred in the last 10 years for the drama that continues to happen in our country has taken people all over the world. And they've always taken their, their uh, this, we say the arepa, so the, the flour that makes the arepa, uh, they've always taken it with them to all the communities uh, where they've landed in the world. And uh, nowadays we have 3,500 arepa bars in the world, which is an enormous <laughs> amount considering the short term of this exodus, you know, that is 10 years. But besides the arepa, so the arepa is like this friendly daily thing that we all eat either at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or four in the morning after, you know, a day of drinking and dancing. This, that's when a lot of people <laughs> go to arepa bars. But um, there's a whole other culinary tradition that um, that is constructed with uh, many different cultural ingredients. First of all, you know, the Amazonian ingredients are something that very much is unknown uh, to the United States because they don't get imported yet because nobody really is using them. I import them in my suitcase. I won't tell you how, but <laughs> they do arrive to Alma right. Lucina in all kinds of ways, you know? <laughs> so that's one thing, but we have different climates in the country. We have the mountain, we have uh, the Amazon, we have the, the ocean, the Caribbean ocean, and we have the plains. And all of these different uh, climate or microclimates, let's say, which are all tropical, uh, they have their own specialty. So fish, of course, is a is a huge thing uh, in our country as well. Uh, fruit, lots of different fruit. We are very known for cacao, 
Uh, one of the finest cacaos in the world comes from Venezuela and all the chocolatier in the world generally, you know, utilize uh, cacao from Venezuela. Our coffee is very famous, unfortunately, doesn't get exported for, again, the same reasons that we're talking about. <laughs> so what we try to do at Alma is to highlight those um, those known and classic ingredients that we use. And uh, and when, when I'm able to go now, I haven't been able to go very much because there's no flight between our countries. There are no flights. But normally I've always been able to bring certain specialties here and add them to us. So that's one thing, the, the, the local the local ingredients. The other thing that composes our, our, our menus generally is very interesting is that we were colonized by Spaniards. And when the, when the Spaniards came, the Spaniards, they came with tradition that already was mixed with the Moors, you know, the, the Arab world that came into Spain and brought in this whole sweet and savory uh, mix, you know, in their flavor. So they have a lot of dried fruit and they have nuts. And, and uh, so they combine sweet and savory. And that I would say is a very fundamental flavor combination in Venezuelan food. We always have a plantain somewhere. Or we always add a little sugar. Or we have raw sugar that, that become little syrups that we add to spices and do things with it. So there's always this presence. So that's another element that's sp the Spanish and Moorish in impact, cultural impact to us. And they brought wheat also to Venezuela. We only had corn. They brought wheat, so we have some elements of wheat, um, a lot of elements of uh, corn in yucca. Yucca is another big presence in our right. kitchen as well. Mm -hmm. So, and then the third thing, of course, is you know the slaves that were brought in that also are very much inhabitants of the villages of, of, along the coast also brought in their own uh, culture and their own traditions. And so we have a country that is based with local ingredients, Spanish, Moorish, and black Venezuelans. <laughs> so all mm -hmm. of this together uh, create these flavors that we are trying to present at Alma. Uh, so please, when you go to Alma, be adventurous and not just get the arepa, which is fantastic, but arepa is quite filling actually, but also experience the entrees and the other meals that we have because we want to show the uh, this incredibly rich combination of ingredients and flavors that Venezuela represents, especially with contemporary techniques that we're doing, so that you'll find all this in Alma. Okay. So there's a menu up, amacochinalatina.com. You can pick up their clothes Monday, Sunday and Monday, is mm -hmm. it, or yes. just Sunday. Sunday and Monday. Sunday and Monday. Monday. But meals are available from 5 p.m. on for pickup. And you can order online. It's very simple. And um, I got a little note from Eric Seely. He says, best of luck, Miss Stein. My family enjoyed our last meal with you and hope to again. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I was there. I'm trying to think what was it we were doing. The, um, the beverage. There was a promotional thing for the beverage. Um, the the two boys. Way? The, the um, Papa Hemingway? No? Papa Hemingway. The rum? No, no, no. no. They're local and they're doing... Oh, uh, oh, King Collective. King Collective. Yeah, I believe so. Yes. So it's very nice there. Um, so this will pop up, everybody. So you can go to the site, almacachinalatina.com, if you want to learn more about Alchemia. That is alchemyabaltimore.com. They all have social media. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's I have a question for you, just a little bit different, and there might not be an answer for it. Cafe Azafran, Almacachina, Alchemia. Is there any reason why they all start with A? Uh, no. Well, the, the, it started by the fact that I love the Arab were the the Spanish words that start with a that come from Arab origins because they're so beautiful they're so beautiful to hear and so asafran came from asa afran which means saffron and mm -hmm. alma in this case was i mean alchemia again it was this idea of alchemy which i loved alchemia it came from again the moors coming into spain and alma is simply because it's so 
And we've always wanted to, for me, that was a, the original concept is that I wanted the spaces that we create for food, we wanted them to be uh, spaces where you feel at home, away from home. So yes, it's a restaurant, but at the same time, the idea is that you come in and enjoy yourself completely with music and lots of plants, as you know, like in a garden, and then experience all these this food in a relaxed atmosphere, although, you know, we have from menu that is comprised from street food all the way to the finest, you know, fine dining, all of it together. Fine. So so we can Just all enjoy me. Alma in every level, no matter what the budget, and, and, and we can coexist in the same and establish dialogues in the restaurant one day again after the pandemic, and all kinds of people can share you know, um, the same space, so. Both are taking place at Station North, 1701 North Charles Street, which used to be the Chesapeake restaurant. It's had a couple different things in there since, but um, it's a great location. And uh, right next to the theater, so do the theater. Things will come back. Um, yeah. I want to support it. I want to go back to, um, we had talked and your your mother was from South America, but your father mm -hmm. was Polish. Mm -hmm. And you didn't only live in Caracas. You lived in Paris. You grew up in mm -hmm. Paris, in Brussels. And But your mother was the one who instilled, as you said, was like Don Quixote. You know, um, she really wanted you to keep alive that South American roots that you had and the food. And if she were here and, you know, she passed recently and my sympathies, I'm sure she was quite proud of what you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, we had talked, you know, Baltimore, you know, you could have gone anywhere in the world with your background. And I'll let you explain. I asked you the other day, why Baltimore? Why pick, you know, Baltimore out of anywhere you could have been? Why Baltimore? So um, I was living in San Francisco for 18 years after I graduated from Stanford. I, I stayed there and uh, stayed there for 18 years. And I had, you know, uh, this career in, in arts, in the arts, basically, interior design. And um, I was doing a lot of shows on the East Coast uh, as well. Uh, all along the East Coast. So that already prompted my interest also. It was closer, you know, imagining flying from from here to Venezuela, which we did. We're very tight family. So we constantly went back and forth. It was easier from the East Coast. But um, as I was telling you the other day, I think uh, it was important for me at the end of the 90s to leave San Francisco because uh, the high tech industry had taken over all the, that environment. It was very difficult for an artist to make a living there. Everybody was uh, geared towards technology and it changed a lot the spirit of the region. And I didn't want my daughter, who at the time was 15 years old, to be raised in, in such an environment, you know, for her to think that the world had all this privilege. Um, and I really wanted to live with her in a, in a place where realities are very different for a lot of people, just like in Venezuela. And so uh, when thinking of the East Coast, I just analyzed all the different cities and it was between Baltimore and Philadelphia. Those were my two favorite cities. Philadelphia is a fabulous city. Baltimore had two things. It was Park School. My daughter went, you know, tremendous scholarship there. And she, that school were forever indebted to that school. It was really great. Um, and, um, you know, I was able to buy a house here. That was not, not possible over there as well. And I thought also that I had never lived in a small town, a small city. And I found it to be really interesting because it had so much history in here, so much history that was very meaningful and representative of the, the different realities of the United States history for different uh, communities. Mm -hmm here and i found that to be really a great opportunity to see san francisco is a population that comes and goes and comes from all over the world here it was a, a very established community that has been here for decades generation after generation and um i i just was really taken by that and the beauty of this city and i don't know it was just a city that attracted me so much and that has been really lovely for for me and and all the people that i have met uh 
at the course of all this time through Hopkins, through what we're doing right now, it's it's extraordinary good fortune to be connected like this in the city and the city that is trying so much to have this incredible turnaround of circumstances and in solidarity with everyone. And that's what motivates me the most to stay here and to have this commitment right now with Meritage and Collective to do alquimia and to reach out to those communities much further than just feeding. We're talking about sustainability. We're talking about changing food policies we're to, uh, or, uh, or supporting them as food professionals. We're trying to work on nutrition. We're work, working directly to far, to, with farms. And so all of those things need a lot more time. And I look forward to creating more of those contacts with, with the vast community and relating them to alchemia because it's a, a very holistic approach and it involves so many people and the idea is of solidarity, you know, to abolish this idea of food policy makers are over there and then the researchers are over there <laughs> and everybody's is doing their own thing. But how it, this would be great as a center of dialogue and support and solidarity towards those communities that should no longer live under the, you know, the existing structural racism, you know, the divided lines in here, and we should all make an effort to abolish the food apartheid completely and really establish solidarity, support, and exchange of dialogue and all that. That's, that's the goal. And that's what I well, love about Baltimore. Well, aren't we lucky that you chose us over Philadelphia? <laughs> I love Baltimore. We are. I love Baltimore. <laughs> We're very lucky. And I think Baltimore is a good microcosm of what's going on yes. around the United States. And um, especially with your degree, if anything, 2020, <laughs> you know, as a cultural anthropologist, you must have blown your mind. Um, I want to wrap up and we can talk forever, but um I want to wrap up. I have two questions that I ask you. <laughs> and number one, number one, what was your culinary, what was the most culinary epic fail that you ever had? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> so I could uh, go on the route. I mean, I, I, I remember two disaster, uh, disastrous things, but that's not the one that, the ones that I wanted to talk about. One was that we had a new chef and uh, we did a catering job and the chicken wasn't fully cooked and it was a catering for 200 people. And I, in Spanish, they say, please swallow me earth. I wanted to earth the earth to swallow me. And I didn't sleep for days and I couldn't eat for days because I'm such a freak about excellence that it was really hard for me. That was one. And then another one. What? I said that would be hard for, I would, I oh, would be down. That was dying. terrible. That, but the other epic one, which was really funny, is that we we did a lot of catering at Hopkins with different professors in their houses, uh, you know, with their groups and their whatever staff and their guests. And uh, there was one instance where we had we had put together this catering for such a date, let's say February thirteenth, and right. uh, <laughs> and the whole time that date was there, it was given at the beginning of our conversations, but it was the wrong date. And the real date of the catering was February 12th. So here we are on February, you know, February uh, 12th. And thank goodness the day before we had uh, prepped everything to be cooked for this particular event. And the day of the event, which I wasn't aware of, <laughs> we are, you know, we have prepped all morning, etc. And I'm going on to a party of, um, you know, some friends with food on my hands and then the client calls me and I'm saying, oh, I'm checking to see what time I'm arriving tomorrow, et cetera. And they said, Edina, where are you? You normally are here always ahead of time. So ahead of time. So we're wondering where you are. And I'm going, uh, <laughs> it's tomorrow on my calendar. And we have had, you know, 20 emails going back and forth. And the date was always there. And so there was this mishap. And so I thought, okay, what in the world am I going to do? in the next three hours right so a whole meal for 45 people in the next three hours so i thought oh my god i'm going to call a restaurant in baltimore that i would trust very much and then i'll just order all the food from there and bring it but let me ask the staff you know if we can pull it off and hopefully i'll find them so here i am hanging up 
and, and I tell them, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to take this as a TV show. Uh, I told the client because I didn't know what else to say. <laughs> it was so horrible. And I said, thank goodness they knew me, I knew them. So it was fun. let's take this like, like a TV show. So now we have this date mistaken. We've prepped the food. Let's see what I can do. Hang up and I call the chef who happened to take the phone, which was incredible. And so he picked up the phone. I tell him the, the story and he says, well, okay, well, let me get going. And so he flies to Asafran, you know, to start cooking, but he needed an assistant to make this happen in no time. And I call um, one of the wonderful line cooks that we had and she picked up the phone. She said, I'm on my way. So <laughs> while I'm setting up the whole thing at these people's home, they're preparing last minute all these things and we're not served. So thank goodness, you know, this, the universe is always, always, you know, a lot of times on my side, which is, I really appreciate that rhythm of the universe is from my Buddhist practice. But anyway, the I, Asafran wasn't far and my husband, while I was setting this whole thing, they started in the kitchen with appetizers and he would bring the appetizers and pretend it was all happening there. But the client, the, the guests never found out that we were walking, working, sorry, from a remote kitchen and all the steps of the way were so rhythmical and we fixed it at the end and the, and the clients were, their eyes were like this big. And so, you know, my heart, I think it had aged 10 years at the time. So from a failure and a, pot a potential catastrophe, we ended up, you know, something like a TV show last minute. And so it was like, again, like in Buddhism, you know, you turn uh, poison into medicine, you turn problems or obstacles into something great. This was the perfect instance to do that. And, you know, so I wanted to I'm tell you. Say, how do you say oi in Spanish? Huh? How do you I say I was going to ask you, when you said that, when you started the story, how do you say oi, oi in Spanish? Oh, uh, you say ay, 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 or, you know, coño is a bad word, but we say a lot, coño, which is a bad <laughs> word that my grandchildren know, but that's what we say. <laughs> it's a, I love bad words. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> okay. Well, the last question and is, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Um. I think that sign again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think I, you did mention alchemia, but I'll put it there again. Eh? There, alchemia. Right. Alchemia. This is a beloved child of the pandemic, but this is the beloved uh, company, project, initiative, commitment, solidarity. All those fantastic words behind this. And uh, that we want this to exist because all the residents of Baltimore and Baltimore County care for the citizens of Baltimore. If we as a small city ha are able to contribute to this um, initiative or commitment, the solidarity is not only um, the money that makes these meals go on and on and on, which is a long-term commitment that we have no end to it. We just want to continue doing this, but also once we understand and communicate what are the realities of the city and how all together we can transform uh, the city into a way improved city in the things that we're lacking, lagging behind, I think it'll be fantastic. And that's what we're, we're, we're looking uh, forward to. So please support Alchemia and please support our restaurants and please support Mera and us and our neighbors, Orto and our other neighbors and <laughs> you know, all the restaurants in Baltimore that are in bad need mm -hmm. of support. Support where you can. Um, and as I said earlier, the websites, the uh, links and information will show up on jmoreliving.com. And this video will be up as soon as we wrap it up. It will be up on Jmore Living. And people share it. Share it with people. I think some important things were said here today. And if you're in Baltimore or any city, this is an important, important guest that we had, and I'm thrilled that she took the time to share her time with us. Um, so I want to thank you, Arena. We will meet again sometime, mm -hmm. somewhere. What did they say? What did Humphrey Bogart say <laughs> to um, 
whatever. We'll see each other soon. And uh, I thank you once again, my best regards and huge success in everything that you do. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today with us. Hi. And I don't know. There you go. All right. So next week, our guest will be the woman who is considered to be the expert on Japanese food, like Julia Child was on French food, will be our guest, Hiroko Shimbo. Uh, she'll be coming to us from New York. She is a cookbook author, teacher, tour guide, and much more. Very fascinating woman. And if you're trying to cook or do anything sushi or any type of food, you want to learn about misu and what's going on, Tune in next week at the same time, and our guest will be Hiroko Shimbo. Um, as I just said, this video will immediately be up on the Facebook page for perpetuity. It'll go up on jmarlivingspage.com. And if you need to reach me, food at jmarliving.com for emails. My social media is at Dara Cooks. We love it when you share the show and let people see what's going on here in Baltimore or what's going on in the culinary world. So as I always say, wear your mask, stay safe, and may your plates always remain full. Thank you for tuning in and I will see you next Thursday. <music>